Hey, how's it going everybody? Charlie Wilson here, aka Sinister Charlie. Welcome back. Hi. Um, how you guys doing? Alright. <laughs> Alright, good. Hey, uh, we've got the Wake Island Fat Electrician video. Uh, this has been requested a few times. My microphone's all weird. Um, yeah. Alright, uh, <laughs> uh, it's been a weird weekend. My back hurts like hell. Um, I'm just pounding energy drinks uh, since I don't drink alcohol. Um, it's like, I'd, I'd love to be drinking. Oh, this weekend, a, a nice cold beer sounded so good, but I can't. Um, so, yeah, let's get into it. Uh, I don't know why I went into that rant. Um, yeah, here we go. During World War II, the Ow. Japanese military used to think that the Ow. Marines were all Ow. recruited from prisons and insane asylums. Yes. Which, to be honest, it's always made sense to me. But after researching for this video, it's starting to make dollars. Uh, the, quack. Um, this one, I remember some of this from the show The Pacific. Um, I didn't watch the whole thing. Um, but yeah, that one episode. I think it was one of the last episodes, like the Battle of Okinawa. I know this isn't the Battle of Okinawa, but uh, I, I assume it's going to be kind of like that. Today we're talking about the first time that the United States Marine Corps would come toe to toe with the Japanese military. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, Wake Island, a small coral atoll 2,000 miles west of Hawaii, wakey, closer wakey. to Japan than it was to America and highly sought after by the Japanese to be a forward operating base for World War II. The only problem with that was it was currently held by the Americans. 450 Marine Corps artillerymen and 1,200 civilian construction workers, as well Word. as 70 Navy Corps. Oh, and I think that's where um, they came up with the idea it might have come up for, uh, I know this war is the reason the CBs came about. I was in the CBs, by the way, in case you didn't know, in case I haven't mentioned it a million times. Um, but yeah, it used to be civilian contractors and then they, uh, a bunch of civilians got killed. So then they made up the CBs and like army Corps of engineers, stuff like that. Um, but now it seems like we just use, um, contractors again for some, I guess, contract now contractors can carry guns, I guess. So yeah. Corpsman. In this context, for the layman, if you don't know, Navy Corpsman is a fancy word for Marine medic. Corps medic, a.k.a. Doc. And they didn't have much to defend the island with, but they did have six five-inch coastal artillery guns that were actually taken from America's first ever battleship, the original USS Texas from the 1800s. Uh, they also had 12 three-inch anti-aircraft guns, 18 M2 Browning machine guns, 30 Browning 30 caliber machine guns, as well as 12 Grumman F4F Wildcat I've heard fighters. Of the Grumman. In regards to Time, Wake Island is 22 hours ahead of Hawaii, meaning that from their perspective, Pearl Harbor would take place on December 8th, 1941. An hour after the attack on Pearl Harbor had ended, Wake would receive a transmission saying that Pearl Harbor had occurred and that they needed to be prepared. Two hours after that, 27 Japanese bombers would conduct well. an air raid on Wake Island, destroying eight of their 12 F-4F Wildcat fighters before they even left the airstrip. At this point, 400 civilian construction workers would volunteer to help fight if it came to that, and the Marines began training them on how to operate machine guns immediately, while also fortifying fighting positions. Wake Island would then be bombed again. I don't know if I'd uh, do that if I was a... <laughs> if I was a civilian, I'd be like, no, no. I mean, you'd have to, but that's a hell of a... Uh... That's a hell of a call to action. Again on the 9th, and on December 11th, 1941, an entire Japanese naval detachment would arrive at Wake Island, and the battle for Wake would officially begin. As the Marines, the Navy corpsmen, and the construction workers rushed to their battle stations, they would see that they were incredibly outmanned and outgunned. The Japanese had brought with them three light cruisers, six destroyers, three submarines, one submarine tender, two PT boats, and two amphibious see. landing ships equipped with 450 special naval landing forces of the Japanese. Japanese, which is essentially the Japanese equivalent of Marines. As the entire Japanese naval detachment advanced closer and closer to the island, they would finally come within striking distance of the Marine artillery, 12,000 yards. Despite that, and much to the confusion of the Marines, they were all ordered to hold their fire, which made absolutely no sense to them. These men could hit bullseyes at 12,000 yards. Ding. These guys would put a fucking five inch shell through a bedroom window if they wanted to. Why on earth are they being told to hold their fire? But the man in charge of the Marines, Commander Devereaux, realized that the Japanese artillery on the ships actually outranged the Marine artillery and they weren't firing yet. And this must mean that the Japanese thought that their air raids had disabled all of the Marine defenses on the island, which was not true at all because in reality, the only thing they had taken out was the original eight Wildcats from day one. So under the command of Major right. Devereaux, the Marines would continue <laughs> to hold their fire and play possum as the entire detachment advanced closer and closer. 10,000 yards, 8,000 yards, 6,000 so yards. So many yards. 4,000 yards, which as far as a Marine artillery 
government is concerned is point blank fucking range. If they got the any closer, close. these Marines were going to try to put a bayonet on this five inch gun. Okay. The Marines would finally no be given the order to open fire and they would open fire with everything they had and put as many shells down range as they possibly could, taking the Japanese completely off guard and hitting almost all of their ships with effective fire. In a matter of minutes, they were able to sink one of the destroyers by hitting it twice in its magazine. The destroyer Hayate would be sunk Hayate. in 12 minutes. And I cannot stress to you what a big deal this is. At this point in time, Japan has effectively attacked Pearl Harbor and 27 other locations in the Pacific, and they have never lost a single naval vessel. Yeah, uh, it's funny if you've ever seen the video, uh, which I've seen of quite a few times, is the uh, history of the world or... Um uh what's it called history of the world uh it, it's that animated video uh, by uh, bill Wirtz. um but yeah that explains a lot of it if you didn't know any kind of history um about like uh either the japanese one or the uh history of the world i guess is a good one um just if I've seen it. Otherwise, I do a reaction to it. And it took the Marine artillerymen 12 minutes to put one completely under the waterline. Panicking and not knowing what to do, the Japanese naval detachment would turn and retreat. And it is at this point that they would realize that they made a fatal flaw in their attack strategy because they didn't bring a carrier and they brought no planes for air huh. support. Cue this man, Henry Elrod, a.k.a. Hammer and Elrod. Hank, and one of the first main characters that would ever enter the battlefield in World War II on America's behalf. Himself and the other three Grum and Wild cat fighters would take off into the sky they would realize that the japanese naval detachment came with no carrier and no airplanes hmm. overhead and let's face it japanese aa guns might as well be crewed by fucking stormtroopers because they can't hit shit so the four wildcat pilots take off and proceed to kick the entire naval detachment in the ass on the way out as they strafe their decks with machine gun fire and drop 100 pound bombs on their decks now Word a 100 pound bomb <laughs> and machine gun fire absolutely should never be able to sink a major naval vessel like ever good old hammer and hank though managed to park one of those hammer 100 pound bombs directly on top of the depth charges on top of the deck of the destroyer Keep Kisarage you. setting off a chain reaction that would sink the entire naval vessel which is literally the equivalent of killing a grown ass man with a BB gun but somehow he pulled it off anyways which uh, I imagine you might well no nah, I guess not Maybe, I mean, hit him in the eye, I guess. I mean, to be uh, fair, it's just I've seen behavior Home Alone. for the Marine Corps at this point. Now, the smoke settles from the battle, and they have to figure out what all happened, because, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. Come to find out, the only thing that the Marines lost, two of the planes were so damaged that they weren't going to be flyable anymore, so now they're only down to two Grumman Wildcats, and only five people had been injured. Nobody died on the American side. Japan, on the Word. other hand, had lost two destroyers, a submarine, and a suspected 300-plus men. Needless to say, the Japanese are fucking pissed and embarrassed about this entire thing. Which, I mean, they kind of have humiliated. a right to be upset, too. I mean, this was the first two ships they've had sunk during World War II. This was the first tactical loss they've had. And this is the only successful amphibious landing defense using coastal artillery ever in all of World War II. They, they straight up kind of got their asses whooped. And because they're so upset, they pretty much immediately sent out another air raid from the Marshall Islands and bombed Wake Island again. And they continued to bomb Wake Island every day Dang. for the next 10 days. Thankfully, they still didn't manage to hit a whole lot. Total stormtrooper energy just misses every single time. And during this 10 days, the American people would find out that 450 Marines and a bunch of construction workers stood up to the Japanese Navy and told them to get fucked. And this became the silver lining for the catastrophe that was Pearl Harbor. Wake Island was a shining example that the American public looked to and said, if those 450 dudes were able to accomplish that when they weren't ready, imagine what we're going to be able to do once we actually start trying. This victory, unfortunately, would be short-lived because it is now a race between Japan and America to see who can get reinforcements to Wake Island first. The problem with that is the Japanese reinforcements are coming from all their other successful attack missions, including Pearl Harbor, so they have a huge head start on the American. Americans, so obviously they get all of their ships there first. So the Marines call up the Navy chain of command and are like, hey, there's a bunch of more Japanese ships here, including some aircraft carriers. Um, hurry up. At which point the United States Navy, or maybe not the Navy, but the government, somebody at a high level decides that, well, we don't want to lose any more ships, so we're just going to consider all of Wake Island collateral damage, well, and we're going to leave all of all you there to die. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh... You know, people like always, uh, I mean, this happens still today with a lot of stuff with the government. It's about money and uh, they care more, more, more about money. So, 
Anyway. I wish I was joking. No. So the so. first battle for Wayne was it. on December 11th. They then got bombed every day for 10 days straight. It is now December 22nd. They have all been left there to die, except these are United States Marines, so fuck it, we're still gonna fight anyways because that's just how they get down. So December 22nd, 1941, the second battle for Wake Island is about to kick off. In the red, white, and blue corner, we have 450 Marine artillerymen, 400 construction workers, and 70 Navy corpsmen going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a reinforced Japanese Navy of three light cruisers, six destroyers, two PT <laughs> boats, two amphibious landing vehicles, a bunch of more amphibious landing soldiers, one submarine tender, two submarines, mm -hmm. four heavy cruisers, two mine layers, and two aircraft carriers returning from Pearl Harbor, the IJN hear you and the IJN see you. Apparently the IJN smell you and taste you were fucking busy. And now to the Marine Corps' surprise, the entire naval detachment refuses to get anywhere near this island, Jerks. not willing to come within 12,000 <laughs> yards because they don't want to get shot up by accurate marine artillery fire again so instead what they do is they send out their two amphibious landing ships with 900 soldiers on them and they deploy every single plane that their aircraft carriers have the two remaining marine corps wildcat fighters are about to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with 50 japanese aircraft and somehow those two badass marine aviators managed to shoot down 21 Jeebus. Japanese planes, one of which was the bomber of Bombardier Nerobu Kanai, the man that was credited with sinking the USS Arizona. Hmm. This would be considered the first ever revenge for Pearl Harbor. The remaining Japanese planes then proceeded to bomb and strafe the island with machine gun fire. They didn't really do a whole lot of damage, but one thing they did take out was the communication lines leaving the command bunker where Major Devereaux was. And nobody knew that that had happened, so Major Devereaux's inside of his bunker giving orders, but nobody's, nobody's hearing them. So when yeah. the 900 Japanese <laughs> Special Naval Landing Forces uh. landed on the beach and they weren't given any orders, the Marines are kind of like, what are we do doing? We want. What's the play? No orders came through, so they're gonna do what Marines do best, be default aggressive, and go fuck shit up. Given a lack of instruction, they will resort to destruction every single time. The Marines on their own accord decide that they are going to fix bayonets, leave the machine guns and fortified fighting positions with the civilians that they trained, and they are gonna go meet yeah. a two-to-one battle against the Japanese Special Landing Forces on the beach in the middle of bumfuck nowhere in the Pacific. One of these two groups is the best amphibious fighting force on Earth, and they are about to figure it out right now. For the next 11 hours, the Marine Corps and the Japanese Special Landing Forces would engage in close combat, and not only were the Marines successful at defending, they would begin launching counterattacks, and these counterattacks would fracture the enemy line, sending small groups of enemy soldiers all over the island. It is I would imagine that we're uh, in the future, uh, looking at the way the world's going, there might be a lot more naval battles going on. Uh, World's not looking great right now. But. At this point, after like a I didn't mean to sink your ship, <laughs> you know. Of the depression. 11 hours, Commander Devra finally comes out of his fucking bunker after not hearing from anyone this entire time. And in his head, he's thinking all of the positions that had radios must have been overrun. That's why they're not responding to me. So he's anticipating that they're losing. And as soon as he walks out of the bunker, he sees Japanese flags all over the island. And he assumes that the flags had been hoisted because the Japanese were victorious. But that's not what was happening. What he was seeing was Japanese good luck flags, which was a Japanese tradition in World War II, where the Japanese soldiers would have their friends and family sign a Japanese flag, and they would hang it on their rifle when they went into battle for good luck. That is uh. what he was seeing, not flags hoisted in victory because his Marines were kicking their fucking ass. But he didn't know that, so he proceeded to go around the island and force his men to surrender. Right off the bat, huge problem. The Japanese no. at this point in time weren't real big on the whole taking <laughs> no. prisoners thing. They still very much believed in the Bushido Code of Honor, and if you surrendered on the battlefield, you lost that honor, and as far as they're concerned, if you didn't have your honor, you deserve to die. So, it's already not looking that great, and it would become even worse once the fog of the battle finally lifted, and everybody began to look around and realize there's a distinct lack of dead Americans. Plenty of dead people, not many Americans, because over the last 11 hours, the Japanese landing forces had suffered 600 casualties, and the Americans had only lost 52 Marines and 70. Oh, uh, side note, I did go to the Battle of uh, Okinawa, the um, the uh, place for the, of the Battle of Okinawa, when I was in Okinawa. Um, it's pretty intense. <laughs> it's crazy how many uh, craters you see. It's insane. 
construction Just workers. That out I say there. only. I, I highly recommend going. It's way too many. It's tragic. I'm not trying to diminish that in any way. I'm simply trying to explain it was an extremely lopsided battle, and this would only serve to infuriate the Japanese even more. So the Japanese, now thoroughly pissed off, decide they are going to take every American on Wake Island, including the civilians that didn't even fight, and strip them all butt naked and Word tie up. them together in groups of 15 with telephone wire and march all 1,600 of them to the airfield. They then began assembling their crew served machine guns, intending on executing everyone. Jeebus. They then stood there for two days on an airstrip, butt naked in the middle of the Pacific at gunpoint, until the Japanese admiral came out and announced to them that the Emperor of Japan had decided to grace them with their lives. You see, Jeez. the American media had made such a big deal of the first defense of Wake Island that the entire world was watching the events unfold now, and Japan knew that they couldn't get away with committing such a mass atrocity without attracting too much attention, so they decided they were going to actually have to abide by the rules of war and take prisoners. The majority of the Americans would then be loaded onto cargo ships and sent to prison camps either in Japan or Japanese-occupied China. And I'm happy to say that the overwhelming majority of them survived all of World War wow. II in these POW camps and got to return home in 1945 and 1946. Upon returning home, they would find out that only months after their first defense of Wake Island, in 1942, Hollywood had turned their life events really? into a movie. Right. But the problem with the movie was that no... Uh... I don't know any of these actors. Nobody actually knew what happened at the Second Battle of Wake Island, so Hollywood just anticipated that everybody had died, and that's how the movie ended. <laughs> okay. Fast forward like 45 <laughs> years later, there's a Wake Island reunion event where a journalist finally asks all the Marines what they thought of that movie when they first returned home. And without skipping a beat, this man in his 60s or 70s at this point chimes in and says, well, first of all, we didn't actually have a dog there. To which every other Marine began laughing, and it is hands down my favorite part of this story. That's because awesome. somehow that man lived through an entire lifetime worth of shit before he turned 25, and he has now made it into the twilight years of his life with his sense of humor intact and that innate burning desire to be a fucking smartass that every military member I've ever met has. And now the story's See, gonna I get can, weird. Whatever became of I uh I can vouch for that. Wake Island itself, while it would remain under Japanese control for the duration of World War II, every time an American naval vessel drove past it, they would open fire on it with its guns, and they would routinely perform air raids on the island. Now, as fate would have it, one of those air raids on Wake Island would be the very first combat mission of a new pilot that joined the military at the ass end of World War II, and that pilot's name was George Bush. Oh. Don't worry, it's gonna get weirder. <laughs> Returning now to the men as they were currently serving as prisoners of war, the vast. Uh, by the way, that's Bush Senior, not uh, Bush Junior, George W. It's not him. It's uh, this aggression will not stay. I can't do a George Bush Senior impression. Majority were held in POW but the aggression camps will not in stand. Japanese occupied China. Of all the men held there, a single Marine would escape, and he would make his way all the way to northern China, where he would find a group of Chinese communist soldiers, also not super big fans of the Japanese at this point in time, and they would decide, hey, the enemy and my enemy is my friend, I'm gonna make sure this Marine makes it home safe. And hmm. that's exactly what they did. And just as that Marine was about to set off on his final journey home, he would receive a visit from those soldiers' leader, and that leader would wish him well on his journey and gift him with several very nice Chinese rugs. Nice Chinese that leader's rugs. name was Mao Zedong, Whoa. the deadliest human of all time, <laughs> credited with killing somewhere between 40 and 80 million people. That's crazy. Uh, that is weird. He wasn't lying. What would you do if you met Mao? That's crazy. Yeah, the truth is literally stranger than fiction. Yeah. And all of this happening, I have so many questions. But most important of all, the one question I want an answer to more than anything. What do you think that guy did with the rugs? I mean, for real. Oh, on rugs. One hand, I think it's rocks. Kind of weird to keep them. But on the other hand, the rug didn't do anything. And it's a nice it's fucking a nice rug. rug. You know what I mean? Okay, Ties the room together. Out of hand. I have to end it. In conclusion, after Pearl Harbor, the commander of the Japanese Navy, Admiral Yamamoto, would write in his personal diary... Quote, I fear all we have done is awoken a sleeping giant and filled him with terrible resolve. And I personally find it ironic that the first time that his men would come face to face with that terrible resolve, the sleeping giant that they awoken, was would be Wake three Island. days later at Wake Island, where 450 Wake. Marines, 70 Navy corpsmen, and 400 blue-collar construction workers stood together and halted the most powerful Navy on the planet in their tracks for 16 That's days. That's pretty rad, If you made it dude. this far in the video, thank you for watching. The best way to support the channel is go buy some merch at the I will. Stop reminding Black me. Bang, out. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Oh, what? I probably would have kept those fucking rugs. Yeah.
Me too. First thing, we didn't have a dog. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's number one. And uh, Brian Dunleavy, uh, even though he was a good movie star, there was nothing real about the movie, whatever. A lot of war bond drives occurred at the movie theaters. I like how he puts these little videos the at movie, the end. They'd be so pumped up with enthusiasm and patriotism, they'd exit the movie theater and there'd be war bond sales right oh. there, and people would buy war bonds. And it helped the war effort tremendously. Um, wow. Good stuff. Yeah, that was uh, that went by pretty quick. That was highly entertaining. Uh, the only thing I know really about uh, is the Battle of Okinawa. Oh, skibidoo, a go, a go. My back. Nice. Uh, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, uh, thanks for watching, everybody. I really appreciate it. Uh, please like you and subscribe you down below. Makes me feel real good inside. I don't know if I'm rubbing my chest or my stomach. Um, yeah. Uh, and please comment if you got any suggestions for any future videos. Um, uh, the fat electrician stuff, we're probably going to get to all of them. Um, but uh, if you got any other suggestions uh, for like different kind of military related stuff, go ahead and put that in the comments. And I, I will get to it because I'm always looking for new stuff to watch. So, uh, all right. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you guys are having a good weekend and um, bye.